Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. And a report from U.S. Congress says the Chinese renminbi, their currency, could threaten the dominance of the U.S. dollar within a decade. Now, we've seen tough talk between the countries on currency before, and now is no exception, actually. But are we already in the throes of a currency war? We talked to James Rickards, who certainly thinks so. Meanwhile, U.S. President Barack Obama calls the Asia-Pacific region a top priority of U.S. security and policy. And the U.S. is stationing troops in Australia reportedly to counter China's expanding influence. Some of our Marines will begin rotating through these parts to train and exercise with you and to work as partners across the region for the security we all want. But could the next war be waged not with boots on the ground, or for that matter, drones, but with financial weapons? I'm talking stocks, bonds, and derivatives. And one clothing company thinks they have a better solution for U.S.-China relations. Take a look. You see it? Make love, not war. That's Obama smooching China's President Hu Jintao in Benetton's new ad. It's obviously a fake photo, but we'll give you the real story. Let's get to today's Capital Account. U.S. President Barack Obama is in the middle of a nine-day trip in the Asia-Pacific region. And according to reports, really this all boils down to one thing. This is about China. And it's focused on China's expanding influence. Now, high on Obama's list, reportedly, is getting commitments from China to enact a more flexible currency rate. Okay, what else is new? We have seen this song and dance before over currency valuations. Meanwhile, U.S. Congress has just issued a new report, and it says that the China currency, the yuan, the renminbi, that it could threaten the dominance of the U.S. dollar within a decade. But we ask, are we already in the middle of a currency war? James Rickards, my guest, argues absolutely. And he actually wrote the book on it. It just came out. It's Currency Wars, the Making of the Next Global Crisis. I interviewed him earlier today, and he explains what's going on right now as he sees it. Take a listen. We see rhetoric, of course, very publicly between the U.S. and China over currency manipulation. Sure. We just saw that at APEC with President Obama coming out against China, China firing back. We also saw U.S. Congress just come out with a report saying that the renminbi could mount a challenge to the dollar in five to ten years. You say that challenge is going on now and a currency war is going on. Uh, how is it playing out? Well, you know, everyone likes to accuse the Chinese of currency manipulation. Look, every country manipulates this currency to some extent, or what we call manipulation, they call policy. Uh, so I don't think anyone's exempt from that. But the, the U.S. is the biggest currency manipulator in the world. When you look at uh, quantitative easing, which is just money printing, we had QE, QE2, and this new operation twist, all forms of monetary ease. Uh, people think it's about lowering interest rates. It is a little bit, but it's really about cheapening the value of the dollar. Uh, the theory is that if you have a cheaper dollar, it makes U.S. exports more attractive, so we'll sell more Boeing aircraft or General Electric wind turbines, et cetera. The problem is it's, it starts out okay, but it never works out that way. There's retaliation. Other countries try to cheapen their currencies, where they put on capital controls, where they put on excise taxes, and currency wars turn into trade wars. And I described two previous currency wars in my book, what I call Currency War I in the 1920s and 30s, and Currency War II in the 1960s, 70s, on into the 80s. They both had disastrous results, and we're starting down that road again. There's a temptation to think you can get a quick fix for your economy by cheapening your currency, but it never works out that way. It just causes inflation, stagflation, recession, and retaliation. And I want to get a little bit more into those, uh, the history of those two wars, but first I want to bring in our producer, Dimitri Kofinas, because he has a specific question he wanted to ask you about this. Hi, Mr. Rickard. So I want to stay with that issue of uh, manipulation, and also you brought up currency wars one and two. And in the second currency war, a lot of people don't actually know, and you talk about this in your book, that uh, there was a private market for gold before Nixon closed the gold window, and that's what the London gold pool was about, and it was about the suppression of the price of gold because the, the central banks and the governments didn't want the, the markets to push up the price and to expose kind of the money printing that was going on during the 60s. 
What do you think is the analogy today? Is there an analogy? And what sort of market manipulation do you see by governments and central banks to suppress not only the price of gold, but any kind of indicator that shows what the government is, the governments are doing as far as these currency wars are concerned? Right, it's a good question, Dimitri. There's always been a private market in gold in addition to the gold standard. Now, the classical gold standard of the 1870s, the private market and the public market were the same because countries were responsible and they managed their currencies in such a way to maintain the price of gold. When you come forward to the 1960s, what was happening was the official price of gold was $35 an ounce, but the private market was getting up to 40, 41, 42. So the G7 governments plus Switzerland intervened and started selling gold into the market to drive the private price back down. In theory, if it went too low, they would buy some gold and kind of conduct open market operations. What happened over the course of the 60s was that the gold selling operation, the manipulation operation, got out of control. They, they were just losing too much gold. And by 1968, it was a one-way bet. Uh, the private market was up here, and, and people were just buying all the gold that governments would offer. So they, they closed down the London gold pool. We remained on the gold standard until finally 19, 1971. President Nixon said, sorry, even, even countries can no longer get gold from the United States, and gold was abandoned completely. Now, today, the market price of gold, we all know, is about uh, seven, between $1,700 and $1,800 an ounce. Uh, I like to say we're still on the gold standard. I get paid in dollars, but I'll, I'll go out and buy gold bullion and you know, put it in secure storage. So I, I've got my own uh, you know, gold supply, and I recommend the same thing for other investors. So you're still on the gold standard, just not at a fixed price. Um, but to go back to a gold standard, which is one of the things I talk about in the book, the implied price of that is much, much higher, on the order of, say, $7,000 an ounce. It's not a pie-in-the-sky uh, you know, projection. It's just the ratio of paper money to gold. When you actually do that math, that's where you come out. There's a range, but that's about where you come out. So what's going on today? We have seen gold lending operations. There was a footnote in the, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, annual report the year before last that discloses. This is, uh, by the way, Central bank operations in gold, that information is kept as secret as nuclear war fighting codes. I mean, it might actually be easier to find out how to launch a nuclear missile than to find out what the Fed does in the gold market. It's, they're, you know, they're lying to the people. They're not uh, transparent about what they're doing. There is manipulation going on. The extent of it is hard to say. Uh, the exact operations, whether it's leasing or, or other kinds of price suppression or conspiracy, Difficult to say, but it's clearly going on. Speaking of manipulation, Mr. Rickards, and government manipulation of gold, in 1933, the government actually confiscated private citizens' gold. Right. Uh, and you've talked about how the New York Fed holds a lot of gold for other countries uh, here in the United States. Do you think that confiscation of private citizens' gold or of other countries' gold could be a possibility? Well, I'm always amazed that you get back to the first day of the Roosevelt administration, FDR, in 19, March 1933. He issued a series of executive orders, and he did confiscate all the gold of all the U.S. citizens. He also closed every bank in the United States. Every bank was shut down. It was called the bank holiday. Can you imagine a president trying to do that today? I mean, I can't. By the way, the no. legal authority is still there. The legal authority hasn't changed. I think if the, if the government came after uh, people's gold today, there'd be a lot of resistance. But I say it's not necessary. What the government will do, if, if you see the price of gold go to five, six, seven thousand dollars an ounce, which I think it will, in order to stabilize money. They'll just put on an excise profits tax. They'll say all you people who bought gold at say a thousand or twelve hundred, it's now worth six thousand. Well, that's an unfair windfall profit, and we're going to put a ninety percent windfall profits tax on you. Government's done things like that before, so they won't confiscate the gold. They'll just tax away all your profits. Uh, as far as the foreign gold in the United States, that's a very interesting question. A lot of people don't know Fort Knox was built to hold the gold that FDR took from the American people. They, they ran out of room in the basement of the Treasury, and they had to build a, a vault. U.S. gold is not at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The U.S. gold is uh, half at Fort Knox and half at West Point. But there are 6,000 tons of gold at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that belongs mostly to Europe, Japan, and the IMF. Now, I'm not saying this would happen lightly or any time in the near future, but in extremis, if you saw a collapse of the dollar, the U.S. could confiscate that gold there's another 3,000 tons out by JFK Airport and where in vaults run by Scotiabank and HSBC, they could confiscate that gold. So with the U.S. 8,000 tons, 6,000 tons from Europe, and 3,000 tons from private hands, 
the U.S. would have you know, upwards of 17,000 tons, which would be 70% of the official gold supply in the world. That's about where the United States was in 1944 at the end of World War II when we started Bretton Woods. So the U.S. could really reboot the entire financial system and issue a new gold-backed dollar. It's like starting the game over and wiping out all the debts. Wow. And speaking of a gold-backed dollar, I want to talk just real briefly about SDRs, which is a currency that the IMF would issue. Do you think it would be possible right. for them to do that with any credibility without it being backed by something like gold? Well, they're certainly going to try. I think in the end it'll fail. It's a very good question, Lauren, but I think they'll try. I think this is the preferred solution of the elites, what I call the Davos crowd, uh, you know, the power elite, the central bankers, the finance ministers, the treasury officials, people of the IMF, et cetera. The, the easiest way to think about it, the Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. The ECB, European Central Bank, has a printing press. They can print euros. Well, the IMF has a printing press, too. They can print these uh, SDRs, or special drawing rights. It's world money. Uh, it's not backed by anything. It can be handed out, and countries can actually count it as part of their reserves and use it to settle their balance of trade with each other. And they can swap it for other currencies and use those to spend or invest. So it's just another form of printing money. It's completely unaccountable. I mean, who elected the IMF? Uh, but the thing is, the next time there's an acute phase of the financial crisis, something like the Lehman moment in 2008, it's going to be bigger than the Fed. The Fed took their balance sheet from $800 billion to $3 trillion to fight off the crisis in 08. What are they going to do? Go to $9 trillion? That's right. not credible. But what they will do is print these SDRs. So, there, so I view the entire future of the international monetary system as a race between SDRs and gold. I think gold's going to win, but SDRs will give it a run for the money. Well, that's interesting. It's certainly something to think about, as many of the guests right here on this show predict that there will be a Lehman moment coming out of the Eurozone crisis. So pay close attention to that interview. That was James Rickard, Senior Managing Director at Tangent Capital Partners, author, of course, of Currency Wars 2. Now, stick ahead. Stay right here at Capital Account. President Obama is in the Asia Pacific. He's stationing U.S. troops in Australia. But could the next war be fought not with bombs, but with financial weapons? We'll hear about the war games that the Pentagon brought James Rickards in to play. But first, your closing stock numbers. Internal military mechanisms that do not work to bring justice or accountability. I have every right to know what my government's doing. You want to know why? I pay taxes. Well, I would characterize Obama as a charismatic version of American exceptionalism. now for word of the day where we break down a financial term or concept for our very smart viewers but just maybe not the financial expert in our audience and today it's very fitting word of the day it's really a term it's currency war which I was just talking about with uh, our guest in the interview you saw with James Rickards and here is another reason why it really matters today take a look at this quote from Bloomberg from an article there uh, this author says we are in the throes of currency war three and Ben Bernanke has won the first offensive by flooding China with inflation. Now, James Rickards, I've heard argue that that inflation is going to end up coming right back to the United States, but that is beside the point. What exactly is a currency war? Let's take a look. It is a condition in international affairs where countries compete against each other to achieve a relatively low exchange rate for their own currency. And as the price to buy a particular currency falls, so too does the real price for exports 
from the country. So this boosts exports, and this is where countries competitively devalue their currency in order to do that. Now, arguably, the most famous currency war occurred back then during the Great Depression in the 1930s. This is where a lot of Western European countries and also the United States, where this picture is from, they abandon the gold standard eventually and begin devaluing their own currencies. Now, this is commonly referred to as beggar thy neighbor. That is the term. Now, the problem is that fluctuations in exchange rates can have a really negative effect on overall economic activity, and this can result in a deterioration of trade relations and a contraction in global GDP. So basically, that is why many say that currency wars can turn into trade wars, which can turn into actual physical wars. And that's why you need to know what this means. That's a currency war. Now, as I've been mentioning in this show, President Barack Obama uh, has been traveling through the Asia Pacific and he spoke to Australia's parliament. And in that speech, he vowed to expand U.S. influence in the Asia Pacific region, even though, of course, the U.S. is supposed to be winding down to wars, not to mention cutting defense spending. Now, he plans to station U.S. troops in Australia, and reportedly, this is to counter the expanding power of China. Now, you can imagine there's a mixed reaction to this news in the region. And despite any talk of China's military prowess, let's be real in terms of spending. The U.S. spends six times as much on defense as China, and it trumps almost the entire rest of the world combined when it comes to defense spending. So, a bigger question, could the next war not even be a military war? Could it be a financial war? And who would win that? Well, James Rickards was brought in by the Pentagon in 2009 to actually play a financial war game. And again, he's senior managing director at Tangent Capital Partners and author of the book Currency Wars. And he told us how this game played out. He actually played China. He worked together with Russia, and they went after the U.S. dollar. Here's what he did. Russia has been disadvantaged time and time again. They sort of try to play by the rules, the rules of the dollar system, but uh, they, they get into these uh, periodic currency collapses. So uh, we were working, uh, you know, obviously for the Pentagon, and uh, they've done many war games over the decades, uh, but always, you know, military invasions, armor, whatever. Uh, this was the first financial war game where the only weapons allowed were stocks, bonds, derivatives. The main countries, uh, contestants in the war game were the United States, Russia, China, and then we had another group representing Europe and hedge funds. My well, uh, the Pentagon knew how to play war games, but they didn't know that much about Wall Street. My role was to give them that expertise. And then I actually got to play on the China team. But I recruited a friend to join the Russia team, and we cooked up a little plot. We said, you know, let's give the Pentagon their money's worth and show them how the world actually works. And the plan was to have Russia and China deposit their gold in a Swiss vault and then create a bank in London under English law that everyone would trust. And this bank would issue currency backed by the gold. So you as a country could come, put your gold in the vault, get this new currency. But the kicker was Russia and China announced that henceforth they would only accept payment in this new currency. They would not accept dollars. The idea was to try to attack the dollar. And you think about it, stock sponsors, they're all priced in dollars and people worry about a stock market crash. But if the dollar crashes, every single market crashes with it all at the same time. So we, this was the greatest threat we could imagine, and it played out over a couple of days. It's all described in the book. Uh, it takes the reader you know, behind closed doors at a top secret weapons laboratory where we conducted this. So I hope they enjoy it. There's a little bit of intrigue there to start the book, and I hope, uh, hope the readers enjoy it. I think there's a lot of intrigue there, and actually I'm quite intrigued because that was in 2009. It's obviously been a little bit of time, and as far as non-military threats, we've seen more very public emphasis on something like cyber warfare by both the Pentagon and NATO. That was one of their major priorities when I covered their summit last year that, that's a new priority. But I haven't heard a lot of public uh, either consideration of this as a threat or as a tactic of financial warfare. Do you think that the Pentagon is seriously thinking about that in the time since? 
Well, not only the Pentagon is thinking about it, but it's actually part of Chinese military doctrine. There was a, uh, a book published in 1999 by two senior colonels in the People's Liberation Army. The book is cited in my book, so if you have my book, you'll have the, uh, the footnote to uh, point you in that direction, where they discussed specifically uh, financial warfare as a doctrine. Lauren, what you're really talking about, this is under the heading of asymmetric warfare or unrestricted warfare. Nobody can really stand up to the United States head to head. I mean, Russia still has a lot of nuclear weapons, but in terms of surface fleets, military, armor, marines, nobody can really stand up to the United States in, in kind of head-to-head -head combat. But in asymmetric warfare, so that would be cyber, chemical, biological, radiological, financial, and other kinds of unrestricted warfare, uh, the, le the, the playing field is much more level. So this is a threat that's taken seriously. Do you think in the same way that cyber warfare is and, and has become more part of their tactics, do you think financial warfare is too? Uh, yes, it's something to think about. I think cyber warfare is more of an immediate threat. We're seeing cyber attacks every day. These financial attacks, we have financial panics in the market. We have financial crises. But I'm not suggesting that these are caused as acts of war. These seem to be, uh, I like to say we shouldn't worry about the Russians or Chinese attacking our financial system. We're doing a good job of destroying it ourselves through <laughs> over leverage and, 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 and bad regulation by the, the Fed and others. So I'm not, I'm not saying the current financial panic are acts of financial warfare, although we are in a currency war. That's a, that's a separate thing. Uh, the cyber warfare is more concerning. It's more front and center. It's happening all around us. Uh, but financial warfare is something that, uh, let's put it this way. If you were in an asymmetric war with the United States and you were, there were cyber attacks going back and forth, why not launch a financial attack while you're at it? It's what's called a force multiplier. Take the damage you're doing and make it worse. There you go. It's really certainly an interesting prospect. That was James Rickards, and his book, Currency Wars, is on shelves now. All right, we've talked currency wars, we've talked trade wars, we've talked actual wars. Now let's talk about some business-related legal wars. And I have our producer, Dimitri Kofinas, in studio to help me out, as well as Shannon Donahoe, our other producer, in the control room to give us her insights as well. Because maybe you remember the story, maybe you don't, but back in August, Abercrombie & Fitch, the clothing company, said that they would actually pay the situation, as in the character on Jersey Shore, not to wear their clothing. Here's a little bit of insight into why. I'm a guy and I know that it just doesn't work like that. But I'm a girl and I know. I know some, I know stuff that you don't know. So he was wearing Abercrombie sweats and Abercrombie said that basically that the Jersey Shore was ruining the reputation. I don't know how that's possible. But now the situation has fired back and he's actually filed a lawsuit against Abercrombie and Fitch saying they infringed on his GTL and situation remarks and capitalized them unfairly, capitalized on them unfairly with clothes. So what do you think? Does he have a case here? Uh, he looks, does his body look weird? It looks like some kind of seal or something weird. Like it just, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just something I noticed now. I'd never actually seen him with a shirt off before because I don't I actually watch the show. I just know that these guys are total losers. And um, I can imagine why Abercrombie and Fitch wouldn't want to be associated with them. Wouldn't want them to be associated. But does he have a case? Should they be able to capitalize think, on like his should have a case. phrases? I don't think people like to show any case on anything. I don't think that they should exist, period. I think that these should just go away. They should just go away. Shannon? That's, that's... I mean, I see it for, I don't know, entertainment value. I don't mind the Jersey Shore. I'm not saying I'm a fan of it, but I've watched my fair share of episodes. And I don't know. I mean, I think he does have a case because obviously they did kind of capitalize on it. And now they're like, oh, we're going to pay you not to wear our clothing. But, you I'm... know, too bad. You already made clothing that was like based off of the stuff that he said. Yeah, that is kind of a double standard. The thing is, I don't know if Abercrombie and Fitch can really afford this right now. I don't know if $4 million is material. I have a feeling it's not. But I used to actually cover this company when I was in equity research. And I was just looking at what my boss was saying about Abercrombie's earnings yesterday. And he was saying that they're a total disaster. So Well, there you go. They got, a, they got a situation. They, Abercrombie, has exactly. the situation. Deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's move on. Because here's someone else that has a situation. So, Rick Perry, we know, <laughs> has touted himself 
uh, as business friendly and Texas as business friendly. It's kind of been his whole shtick. Listen to what he said a year ago, though, at a Texas ribbon cutting for a Chinese company. It's called, I believe, Huawei. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but listen to the ribbon cutting. This is a company with a really strong worldwide reputation. <laughs> really strong reputation. Okay, here's the situation for Rick Perry. Now Congress is investigating this company for spy threats, saying that their expanding telecommunications presence may pose a national security threat to the U.S. So I don't know. Who do you think comes out stronger here, Rick Perry or Congress or this company? This company's coming out smelling like a rose. It's Rick Perry. Rick Perry's basically, he is... He's probably like a, a double agent for the Chinese <laughs> because he's the perfect guy. You know, you'd never expect it. He's from Texas. He's got this, like, whole Texan thing going on. And, you know, we remember George Bush, obviously, only Nixon can go to China. Now it's only Rick Perry can spy for the Chinese. Well, poor Rick Perry, too, because we've seen all of his poor debate flubs, all of that. The last thing he needs is to have, like, this be his, you know, business-friendly ventures. He's a freaking, he's on a, on a slow train wreck towards Iowa. What do you think, uh, Shannon? You're, you live near Iowa, right? Um, kind of. <laughs> used to. Not now. I don't know. I think, honestly, like, it's more of a case of, you know, as a governor, like, he was at this ribbon company cutting you know it's unfortunate you know that he has this relation now that he's running for president yeah i bet he i bet he wishes that that video wasn't on youtube anymore it was pretty easy to get i would think with the press he would probably wipe that out especially considering there's now an investigation now whether that investigation is merited or not i mean who really knows yeah who knows right? yeah who really knows <laughs> uh moving on though speaking of uh lawsuits we've been talking about him a North Carolina couple is suing AirTran for $100,000, plus the price of their tickets, after they saw something truly disgusting Jesus. crawling out of air vents. They saw cockroaches. Watch this. Problem? The couple says cockroaches coming out of air vents and carry-on compartments shortly after takeoff. They took these pictures, which are now part of their lawsuit. And I mean, it's gross, but is this a classic case of frivolous lawsuits? I don't know. That's gross. I've never seen anything like it. But I'm not surprised. This is AirTran. I thought Air. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds. I mean, like it sounds like something you'd find on AirTran, like a cockroach. And this thing is huge. I mean, was it this? Is this actual size? Yeah, Shannon? that's that's real size. Is this actually the size? No, of the it's not the actual size. It could be though. They lasted through the dinosaur age. They don't die. They just go everywhere. A, a little flight. But come on, $100,000, this is a really good case for tort reform, even though I know that people sometimes get hurt by tort reform. Well, Shannon wanted to give people a million dollars for losing their pet yesterday. Is that the case, Shannon? Not for, I mean, not for cockroaches. If I saw those in a plane, <laughs> like, I know that the guy, like, caught the uh, attention of the flight attendant. I would have been screaming. <laughs> And you're stuck on a plane, man. You can't go anywhere, but $100,000 is ridiculous. What would you have done if you saw a cockroach on the plane? I would have been upset, but I would have never sued. Come on, that's insane. Uh, that's it. That's insane. I'm going to get the final word on that because that's all we have time for. That's it for our show. So thanks so much for watching. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister and give us feedback on the show at youtube.com slash capital account. You can also see anything you missed up there. And don't forget to give us your comments and questions because we're doing viewer feedback now. And if you send us a video with your question, your brilliant remark and feedback, we'll air the best ones. So you can put those in the comments of our YouTube page as well. I'm Lauren Lister and from everyone here at Capital Account, until next time, have a great night.